Today we have uh, Dr. Craig Shuttleworth, who's working with us on the project in partnership with the Red Squirrel Trust, working on uh, looking at grey squirrels and particularly the impacts they have on trees and bark stripping. Do you, do you want to tell us a bit more, Craig, about the, the bark stripping impacts? Yeah, they're devastating. Uh, when you come to a plantation forest uh, and you'll find that oak and sycamore and birch in particular in trees that are between 10 and 25 years of age can be decimated by grey squirrel damage. In a woodland like this, more, more natural woodland where things are growing a lot slower, you tend to get less damage, although the damage is significant in certain uh, times of the year in certain tree species. So we've spent the last hour wandering around looking, and the more you look, the more you find. Mm. It tends to be damage high in the canopy, and sometimes significant, you know, areas as large as the palm of my hand. So we see there's a willow tree just behind us here, and we've got three or four size palm sized up here, which then obviously there's, there's, two, there's, there's parts of the canopy that have, have died from that. So yeah. that tree will never reach its full potential as such. But then we, we found obviously thumb sized ones as well, and you explained what they meant that sort of lots of different types of like thumb sized kind yeah. of bite marks. So the, the thumb, the thumb, thumb sized marks, say 50 pence in size, they tend to be where a grey squirrel's come along and it's began to experiment, if you like, to see what's underneath the bark, how, how much volume of sap there is. That's what it wants. It wants high volume of sap. And you find those not always associated with bigger areas of stripping, uh, quite often on their own. Where you find stripping taking place and it's, and it's particularly damaging is where large areas are removed. Mm. And then they can take all the bark around the tree. And when they do that, whatever's above that point on the tree stem will die because it's removed the ability for water to be able to move up and for sap, sweet sugars, to move down. Brilliant. Thanks for... Yeah, that's so it's all explanatory there and brilliant. So, so we, we keep on looking in the woodland today and to do some more surveys and see how much um, the grey squirrels are affecting this particular woodland. You want to have a look at some older damage here with callus around it. This is a few years old. This is a squirrel that's stripped... What's that? Probably 50 centimetres at least in length, maybe more, 75. It uh, would have taken it not very long, a few minutes, to do that, and it, it's there forever now. And of course, it allows rot in, all sorts of um, pathogenic fungi can get inside. It's not great, and it, and it stops the flow of nutrients coming down through to the roots and water going back up. It restricts it. So that's obviously going to affect the growth of the tree. It's not good. I just heard from Craig there talking about the effects of grey squirrels on woodlands and how they bark strip individual trees, and that quantifying that effect then afterwards of the health of the canopy and the health of the regeneration of the woodland. Owen is working with us today and we've been looking at ways of surveying for that bark stripping through the entire woodland. Owen, do you want to tell us a little bit more about how we survey for the bark stripping? Yeah, so it's, it's a fairly challenging process. There's no um, standardised way to survey for uh, squirrel bark stripping uh, at the moment. Um, so there's different, various different techniques that people use. Um, and we're, uh, um, a key output of our project is that we're going to hopefully develop a technique that could be used uh, in any woodland, in any context. Um, so in the Elway Valley here, we've got a very challenging terrain. Um, we've got a lot of uh, sort of steep-sided woodlands, as we have here. Uh, we also have uh, a, a really kind of heterogeneous woodlands. So there's lots of different types. There's, um, there's broadleaf mixed woodlands, there's conifers. Um, so it, what we're really w working to do is to, to develop that standardised technique that can be rolled out in any woodland, um, hopefully even by um, sort of people that have received fairly minimal training, um, but also, of course, collecting data that is uh, collected in a, in a way that is robust enough to be used as a proper sort of full scientific paper. Um, so so we're, we're working with um, the National Forest have, have, have developed a, a methodology uh, looking at, at, at trees and then the nearest neighbour method around that particular tree. So, yeah, Owen, do you want to explain a little bit more about the, that methodology and how we're trying to develop it for the actual types of woodland here and the types of terrain yeah. as well? Absolutely, yeah. So National Forest has done some great work on this. They've really broken the ground on it and we're just trying to refine it for our, our study area. Um, so uh, as part of that survey, there's a series of plots. Um, the plot starts at a single tree. So you have your, your centre tree, or tree zero as we're calling it, and then you choose your five nearest neighbours around those and survey those trees. 
Uh, in their original study design, they did a, a zigzag walk, but as I just said, with the, the challenging terrain that we've got, that was very, very difficult. And we also wanted to introduce a bit of randomization in there. So we've randomized our plots beforehand using GIS, and now we've come uh, to the plots. We navigate to the plot with uh, our sort of uh, GPS. We go to our plot zero. We record what the tree species is. We will be recording uh, DBH as well. And then we survey each of the five nearest neighbors around that. Um, one of the real challenges we're finding is how we sum those impacts or how we aggregate them because, uh, as I said, it's a really dynamic, different environment. We have some trees like this where it's a nice single stem tree that's relatively straightforward to, to survey, but in the background there you have coppice, uh, uh, coppices there, which are a little bit more tricky. So if we have impact on one stem and another stem, do we add those mm. together? Do we take it? Do we, do we take the, the so main So the, the hazel stems, we can have multiple stems there. There's probably... 30, 40 stems on that that, that coppice yeah. stool there, but then some are, are, are dead, some are alive, some have actually been killed by bark stripping. But then, yeah. do you count them as part of the survey? So, yeah, absolutely. yeah, so every it, woodland's different, isn't it? Sure. So. Yeah, and just one by one, we're sort of knocking through these these challenges and, and working with yourself and, and Craig today. Each new tree and each each uh, new plot kind of presents a new problem, but. As we've worked, we're sort of refining it to the point now that I think we've been pretty consistent and hopefully we can then pass it on to other people, pass it back to the new forest and the squirrel cord mm -hmm. uh, and everybody else and they can work on it as well and we get feedback uh, and ultimately come up with a method that quantifies grey squirrel impacts that can then be used to uh, evaluate our management, mm. um, quantify the effects on a, on a larger sort of national scale uh, and inform sort of policy and decision making thereafter. Yeah. And this can feed directly into the Welsh Squirrel Action Plan, Grey Squirrel yep. Action Plan. And, and we, so by doing this and simplifying it, we can get more and more people involved yep. and hopefully more and more surveys happening. And, and then ultimately more eradication and then we can quantify the effects of the eradication afterwards from further yep. surveys. That's it, evidence-based hmm. management policy, yeah. So as opposed to the squirrel bark stripping that we've been looking at, um, deer as well, fowl deer particularly, um, are prone to stripping the bark, so... Although this could be squirrel, um, it's most typical of being fallow, it's on, a, it's on a deer trail and it's a classic area where they would have bark stripped and rub antlers against as well, so...